Hello everyone, my name is Kai Kurosawa. It is, what is the date actually? It is Tuesday, August 7, 2018. I'm Kai Kurosawa once again, and this is Tuesday Office Hours. And what is the topic? Yes, uh, Trenton, thank you for the question. Well, today, I think I'm gonna probably end up having a lot of new um, viewers, just cause for some reason, the past week I had like 3,000 frame requests all of a sudden. So hopefully a lot of you would actually find this uh, interesting. Hold on. All right, cool. Dale, Dale, hello, how's it going? Um, so yeah, so today I'm gonna actually um, talk about uh, how I play this instrument and also we'll cover some of my original techniques, also cover um, non-original stuff and by the way, when I say original, I'm not claiming that I invented it or something, or, you know, if, if you know somebody else who does it, you know, it's it's fine. I'm not here to say it's just me. Yes, uh, Piersh, sorry, I can't say your name correctly. Hello. All right, so, uh, first things first, let's talk about tuning. I actually had a question about this um, through a private message asking about what the tuning of this instrument is. So basically the tuning of this instrument, it's, uh, it's in three parts basically. It's like a three region, if you will, three instrument in one. So the lowest five, uh, is the five strings in the middle, the black ones. So this is, okay, so the lowest note is a low F sharp. That's below a low B. So we got F sharp, B, E, A, D. So I don't use the open strings that often, but as you can hear, I, I have this dampening here, but you can still use the open strings, which is great. And uh, we have four strings up here, which is actually uh, fretted. So I'm <laughs> glad, glad I got the uh, pronunciation correct. Anyway, so the fretted part has four strings and it's from a G to C to F to B flat fourths as well. Now some people have said that, oh it's like a nine string bass, you know, uh, from the middle lowest string going this way because it's F sharp, B, A, D, G, C, F, B flat. Uh, yes and no. If you want to think of it that way, that's all right with me and I'm not here to um, argue about that because that's just kind of a waste of time, at least for me. That's how I view stuff. The Because the lowest five strings and the top four strings, I rarely use them um, as one instrument. I think of the lowest five strings and also the top uh, four strings as a separate instrument and they have very different timbres actually. And uh, on my left hand we have a C sharp, F sharp, B, A, D. And I play that with my right hand sometimes as well but it's also in force. The C sharp is um, is a third lower than your guitar, than an E. And then D is a whole step lower than your guitar. So it's, uh, it's you know, the range is pretty close to a guitar, basically. All right, let me, let me actually check this really quick. Do we have a question? It's okay, bro, thank you. <laughs> Hello from Anaheim, yeah, all right. Hello, Anaheim. Okay, so let me just kind of play something really quick here and give you an idea uh, what this thing sounds like. Thank you. 
Thank you for the good music comment. in there but you know hey what am I gonna do today right all right so we have a question here thank you I guess the neck is too wide to the cross position left hand tabs on the classicals yes Dale um well yeah, that was close uh, the I let's see I have played this way for about gosh how many years now close to 18 17 something like that um, Yes, so usually you know the Chapman stick which uh, which is the original and Is played um, a lot of players including my students a lot of them play like this they play the lower bass side with their um, Left hand and the higher with their right hand however, as you see I for most part play like this. I have my right hand on my bass side and I have my left hand on my treble side. And the way why I play that way is just um, I wanted to relearn completely how to play this type of instrument. I started with a 12 string um, and I did a lot of tapping on bass and you know I was you know playing lower notes with my left hand, higher notes with my right and then I really realized that I really wasn't uh, using the instrument fully. That's just how I thought of it. So I thought I have to relearn completely the whole thing. And that's when I decided I'm going to play the bass with my right and play the guitar or the treble with my left. And that was just something I decided. And you know, when you're first starting to learn something, you just have to kind of, you know, dedicate yourself to like an idea, ideal, or Whatever it is, you just have to dedicate yourself to it. So I stuck with it, and to me, that 
really started making a lot of sense as the years went by. Even more so as, um, for example, since I have the lowest string in the middle going higher, so in a way my my hand it's like um it's like a mirror shape if that makes sense like if i have like you know that's you know that's the same same thing so the way i'm holding this thing over here you know with the uh index and middle and pinky i can do the same thing over here so for me um it just kind of made a lot of sense as the years went on i didn't think about it when I switch the hands, if that makes sense. It's just, uh, yeah, as the years went by, it started to make more sense. Like, I mean, if I wanted to, not um, not that I'm like a big fan of it, just because that's not my playing style anymore. Um, you know, I could totally, you know, play, play this side. Matter of fact, I still, there are tunes where I actually play, uh, um, uh, my, my hands play on this side as well. You know, so it is possible to play crossed. It's just my preference is to play uncrossed. And yes, Dale, thank you for the great observation. And it is uh, quite a bit of a, a huge neck, but um, I don't have huge hands. A lot of people, I have been getting comments that, that they people think I have huge hands because when I play, um, for some reason, my hands do look a little bigger when I play uh, at a live show, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, I just try to use them as big as I can, basically. But I can I can reach. It's a little. It's not the most uh, comfortable thing, just because I'm not used to that. But yeah, I enjoy it. Okay, so um, let me go back and break down uh, what I was playing earlier. So this tune, it's called Shigatsu, which means April. And I think I've already used this tune in some breakdowns, you know, especially um, with with the previous episode that was in Japanese. So I think I'm gonna cover a lot of topics that I covered last time, uh, just doing it in English this time. So when I say this has three, um, it's like three instruments in one, if you can hear this, this was part of like the improvisation part or the solo part. So, So you can, so that kind of gives you an idea. I hope so. So basically, what, what's happening in my right hand is, so we got the bass note, we got the bass note, and then I'm playing actually a chord on top. Let's see, what I can't remember which. Okay, so here we go. So we got the bass note, and I have a chord on top. So I can do that. I can move that around, of course. Right. You know, there's uh, different variations, of course, on voicings. Um, I'm not being too ambitious at, at those right now because I it's only been a year uh, since I had this, and you know, anyway, I'm not being terribly ambitious with that, not yet. So we'll see. That that'll come soon. Anyway, see, so you could kind of hear. Right, and then we have. Sort of like the improvising or the improv or this lead solo part up here with my left hand. So what that ends up giving you is sort of like three parts. sense why I usually think of it is more like three instruments um, and by the way when I uh, I think the most that I actually really use this as three instruments is when I actually play duo with a drummer this uh, instrument has three actually it has four outputs um, but today it's in mono mode like a, I'm only using a single output so you see here there's three pickups and there's actually one right here that's a Roland uh, divided pickup. So all those pickups have separate outputs. But today, as you can see, is that if I can hold this up long enough, 
I only have one cable coming out of here. That's because I have these switches right here that I can switch the instrument just to send to all to one pickup. Um, not including the divided pickup because that goes to a completely different system. But anyway, so that's uh, when I play with the drummer, I process the sounds differently quite a bit just because it's very fun to do that and interesting and it makes it really sound like a big ensemble, which is which is kind of neat. All right, so. Oh, and then for those of you who already noticed or wondering, the bass side for this instrument, it is fretless. So the 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 five strings right here, the the black ones, they're actually uh, fretless. So you get like a nice fretless sound. Especially up here, like you know, like quite quite sweet. things I do I don't use all the strings at once it's uh, yeah just wanted to make that clear because sometimes you know some people might be wondering like why am I not using all the strings all the time well because for the stuff I do it's not needed and also physically sometimes I can't do it um, for example if I am actually like right there what I was doing I don't know if you heard hopefully you heard the difference but I was um, plucking all the bass notes and when I do that I call it one hand bass hashtag one hand bass but when I do that I actually need um, need uh, quite a bit of the fingers over here to to accomplish that sound so when I do that unless it is uh, already like a pre-written part I don't uh, use the top uh, strings um, but it, for example like that part from Shigatsu So this is pretty uh, written. So this one might be hard to tell. But hopefully you can, you can hear that on the right hand side it's actually all pluck. Like if I wasn't plucking that, that's how it sounds. So that'll be kind of tapped. combination so these are different combinations that I come up with uh, sort of in my head on the fly if it's part of my vocabulary and if not it's compositionally something I will come up with um, I can use the top six strings over here and the four strings over here to sort of create like um, like an interacting uh, melody part or like a close um, voicing for example the the opening you want to call it a melody. I think of it as a melody. I can't say melody today. Like the L's and M's are kind of weird. Anyway. So that is actually, if you can hear. So I got a minor second right there, but sounds pretty nice. So that is how. Uh, I use that as well to get some close voicing, which is usually harder to get on uh, on a guitar instrument. Um, for example, like even if I do stuff like um, okay, that was completely wrong, but <laughs> like if I'm doing like a voicing like that, right? Like I can actually do like a pretty close. So this is unison. That actually gives like a nice voicing right there. All right, can give your independence extra. 
Independence exercise, yes. Thank you for the question. Okay, independence exercise. Are we thinking... Okay, I'm just gonna go over a few things. Independence exercise, first of all, I always... Um, one of the things that I emphasize when I teach um, seminars, group lessons, or even uh, individual lessons is really get comfortable let's see really get comfortable um, knowing how your fingers feel so sometimes especially when you have to do things or want to do things independently in your right hand and left hand um, you realize that you re at least for me I realized that I really didn't have great understanding or the sensation of my fingertips. So in order to develop this, I did a lot of just sitting there and tapping basically scales because that was what I came up with at the time. Like for example, you know, just nothing very exciting, right? But the, uh, but the reason I was doing this a lot was not to play scales, it was to actually learn how my fingers felt. So I used that by doing... Hope you can hear that. So I'm accenting on a different finger each time and grouping the four. So basically, and, you know, if you want to think of 16 notes or something, I'm, I'm accenting like index middle, pinky, index, and why am I uh, uh, <laughs> accenting as well, that's kind of funny, but anyway, you can hear this, accent, 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 so it always switches, like which finger is accenting, so I just did that over and over, and that, that really helped me to feel uh, the fingertips, and like I keep saying, this is not about just kind of playing a scale. It is about actually learning how to feel um, how the fingertips feel, like that sensation. Memorizing how that sensation feels is very, very important in what I think in terms of what I developed. Um, so I would, so once I was able to do that, so for example, like if I was playing this Like this is a kind of a simple um, independence exercise that I used to do which was just basically playing a groove in 7 just you know, nothing too exciting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 Right? And I would do that really slow actually But I did that after, during and after I started getting my sensations really, um, like understanding it, like memorizing how it feels. It's kind of like, I don't want to uh, say something kind of weird, but it's kind of almost like, you know, yoga, like the sensation of how something feels is very important. So, um, yeah. That's like a very basic exercise. And like I want to stress that it is not about sort of playing something. It's more about what goes or what the effort is in terms of the execution of what you're doing. And the reason also why I chose that type of a seven groove, it was because, because it's in seven, um, a lot of time, it, a lot of, responsibility falls on you to keep like a straight like a steady groove I think sometimes you know doing something a little harder and, and plus you can identify that pretty easily right that's pretty easy to identify so you can also start training your brain to hear the two different things because the if you the person who's playing 
it's not going to hear the two different parts then obviously the audience who is listening to you are not going to hear the two different parts so i wanted to make it absolutely easy as possible to identify as the player who's playing to identify the two parts so physically first do exercise that is very important to get your sensations correctly memorized sort of in your brain and then learn to hear the two different parts and for example again right so you can hear that now okay so let's say and then i'm going to keep playing that in my right hand but then the left hand is just going to kind of do that right happening is that's not something well I guess at this point I've done it a lot so it's something I kind of practice but it's something that I can do on the fly pretty much on demand now just because I know how it sounds how it feels and I, I can hear that when I'm playing so that is part of the independence that's happening hopefully that actually helps with the with the question. I know you wanted some more specific exercises, so let's see. Um, I will I will do... I, actually, I had a um, similar question before, so next week I will definitely have like a good exercise to show you. Because right now, off the top of my head, that was the only exercise I could think of because that was something I did quite a bit on my own. All right. All right, David, what is the instrument called? LOL, thank you for the question. So the instrument, this one is, uh, it has a name. It's Kubo. Uh, Michael and Daniel Tobias, who built this for me, were jokingly calling it the aircraft carrier as they were building it. So aircraft carrier, actually, it makes sense when you see it in person, especially. It really is like a gigantic aircraft carrier. Um, An aircraft carrier in Japanese translates to Kubo. So uh, we just fondly call it Kubo now, and hopefully that um, I'll, uh, answers your question. I'm not a fan of the term like touch guitar or touch style, or, or I'm just not. It's uh, it doesn't really. I don't feel like it really represents what I do, just because I tap, but I also pluck a lot, and you know. Anyway, <laughs> enough of that. I don't want to get into that kind of a thing too much, because I I much rather prefer playing and whatnot. So. Anyway, cool, thank you for the question. And Clay Clayson, is that how you pronounce your name? Hopefully, thanks for the thumbs up. All right, uh, let me get back to some of the things that were happening. Oh, yes, and so now, let me talk about some of the basic techniques for me. So, of course, there is tapping. So that is just purely tapping, right? Which to me sometimes is a little bit of a weird note there. Uh, with this type of instrument, you just tap, and it's not the most interesting sound for me, at least all the time. So I came up all these things where I can actually uh, pluck with the right hand, doing like plucking bass lines. So these two fret hold the fretboard. And these two are plucking. Hopefully that makes sense. Right, here we go that way. Now if I was to tap that, right, but I pluck it. Anyway, so that's uh, something I came up with. And also on the left hand, I can actually also miss, uh, strum. Like say if I was to play like this uh, B minor chord, B minor seven if you will, over and over, so that that's the four notes. Four notes in the middle, four strings. If I'm repeating that with tapping, let's say it'll have to be like that. You know, 
which is, I mean, it's got its own sound, but it's not, um, it's not my favorite. Sometimes it's cool to do that, but, but yeah, to me, it's not, it's not the most interesting uh, sound. So I came up with a thing where I can actually also fret and pluck with my pinky. I just call this hashtag pinky reporting for duty because it's my pinky and I'm just kind of telling it what to do and it's reporting to, for duty to me, I guess. So, so once again, if I'm, that is repeated, but then I can strum it by, and that is also repeated. That actually, um, to me, sounds more like, uh, sounds better, especially on the bass. Instead of going, right, I can go. Then we got, like, I, I can actually, with the pinky, I can, of course, instead of just strumming like a chord, I can hit individual notes. Okay, so that's kind of how uh, that works. Let me play another tune now, um, hopefully. And this one is called Haruyokoi. It's a famous Japanese tune. Um, I haven't played this one in a little while, so hopefully I'm not gonna botch it too badly. Hope you guys enjoy. And it's gonna feature a lot of just tapping and also the plucking, strumming, and even some other technique that I haven't talked about yet. So. So that was 
um, you know, an okay rendition, but it's, uh, it's what I got today, what I got right now. And by the way, I forgot to cut my nails. <laughs> Another excuse, right? Uh, Gilles, is that how you pronounce your name? I am terrible with pronouncing names, or anything for that matter today. Come play at my bar sometime. Yeah, I would love to. Where, where are you located? Where is your bar? I will come and play at your bar. If it's, uh, if I am in the vicinity of your bar, I will make sure to stop by. Just let me know where it is, actually. Can you comment on that, please? Okay, so, what was going on there is, I was doing, let's just take the, uh, take sort of the solo part, for example. Um, so this is like a groove I do quite a bit. Why? Because it's kind of easy to do, and it's one of the first things that I learned to do, and it just sort of makes sense quite a bit, um, in terms of, uh, getting to know how to play this instrument actually and that is so we got your bass line kind of like this so what's happening here is I am holding down if you will a pattern It's moving uh, from an F, G, to an A minor. And then on the right hand, that's actually all plucked. So we got pluck, uh, ghost note, pluck, pluck, and then hammer on. So another way recently that I'm starting to uh, prefer, but this is sort of a still a little foreign to me, so I don't do it as much still. However, it is what I'm practicing is to actually, instead of getting the ghost note by hitting it, because that kind of just, um, I don't know, I feel like this way, if you can hear that. So I'm actually getting the ghost note by, um, with the pinky, I am raking, so before hitting the C, I am hitting the one lower string, but I actually have it muted, so I get, uh, I don't get a pitch, I just get that, um, yeah, that percussive sound, and then I rake up to that note, so that gives me, right, so we got, I feel like that sounds more uh, controlled and yeah, it just sounds a little more controlled, which is great. Right, so and if we get that back up to speed a little. So anyway, that's like a newer way that I'm doing it right now, but for uh, our, for this sake, right now I was doing it this way. basically um, sort of a quick explanation of what was going on in the solo part and yes and then the left hand as you were able to hear so regular tapping we have the regular tapping sound and we have the strumming sound and I say sound because um, the most important thing is how it sounds. It's not the actual technique, right? The most important part is about um, how it sounds. So we got the tapping sound, we got the strumming sound. 
So I mean, if if I, in terms of strumming, um, like if I do this. Got a kind of a really nice, I don't know, lyrical, like a different sound than tapping it, and it's just really nice. Now, the one more technique that I was doing there is actually, uh, this is probably one of the harder things that I do, it's actually getting a palm mute sound. Now, usually to get a palm mute sound, you, you know, you have to palm mute, it, I, I'm sorry, the camera's cutting out here, but, you know, you have to palm mute down here, and you get a, a muted sound. However, I could do that um, just with one hand. For example, so we have, right? So that's the regular tapping sound. But I can do that as a palm mute sound with just one hand. Regular, palm mute sound. Yeah, and also even with the strumming, like if I'm strumming, that is just an open sound, and then this is a palm muted uh, sound. And that, I think that might be even clearer there. Right? So how that is being done is actually, uh, when I'm tapping, for the most part I try to aim close to the fret because I believe that's where you get a really a solid good sound in terms of tapping so I am aiming close to the fret and when I'm actually getting the palm mute sound what's happening is I am actually playing on the fret so close to the fret on the fret regular palm muted and I hope that sounds uh, different enough right now sometimes it doesn't come across as much but hopefully it did. So uh, anyway, again, so we have, oh, and by the way, because you know, the frets, they all keep getting closer. The, uh, they, the, the distance between the frets keep changing, right? So it's a muscle memory thing and a guessing thing, of course, to a degree. You have to learn each part of the neck to get a good understanding of how to do the palm mute sound correctly because otherwise like say like if you if you go that way too much if that if that's the sound you want that's regular tapping and that is the palm mute sound if you go this way too much so you, you'll start getting a different pitch so you have to be pretty accurate in terms of uh, where you hit so so if I were to be playing again we're gonna still go with the same chords but back to regular sound, I mean, and then palm mute, see right there I actually made a mistake because I went too much, alright, so Hopefully that made a oh, give me a thumbs up, arigatou gozaimasu. So hopefully that was a cool little um, introduction in terms of how to get a palm mute sound. Do we have um, any any questions about uh, what I've been doing today or about the instrument in general? Uh, and yes, I am gonna make sure I get to the questions. <laughs> so it's, you know. Obviously, this is only your fourth episode, and I really appreciate your support. And, you know, it's just getting used to like doing this whole streaming thing. And it's been good for me just because I get a chance to really see how I play and uh, talk to the camera. And, you know, I had to also kind of, you know, do research and learn how to do this kind of a streaming thing on the you know, and it took me like maybe two weeks to just kind of get the basics down, and now I think I'm pretty comfortable doing this, so... Ah, thank you. You know, there's a new video that I released called uh, Opener. It's the first um, 
solo piece on Kubo that I released. Uh, and I will keep doing like more solo releases, of course. And I'm actually working on a new solo album. If you are interested in getting some of the, the last solo album that I did, which was last year, uh, I will put the link uh, in the comment section later on or even in the description box so you can get it from there. And uh, I am working on a new one, so uh, once that's out, or once I'm about to release it, I'll actually play some of the new material too. But this one opener is from my uh, last solo CD, and that one uh, goes something like this. Now I will link the latest video as well, so hopefully you can check it out from there. Um, but. already it's quite a bit of you know tapping and uh, strumming and so thank you for the thumbs up boss There's this, uh, the solo section is where I kind of want to talk about today a little bit. So the solo section basically just goes between like an E minor and a D, D7, you know. Uh, nothing too exciting or nothing too difficult. It was, um, yeah, it's just something that I landed on for this one. It just kind of makes sense as well. But there's this one thing where I do where I'm keeping... Um, so that's basically just, you know, the root, fifth root, fifth, root, fifth, you know, doing that kind of thing. And then the left hand, uh, I'm actually, like, uh, throughout this tune, here and there, I will use um, this percussive sound where I'm basically just kind of hitting the string, and the pitch does change. But I'm just hitting the, the, the string to get more of a percussive sound than a rather actual pitch. Like, if I were to really hit the string, right? I'll get a pitch, but if I, right, but if I'm actually not committing all the way, taking the string to the fretboard, you get like a percussive sound, especially. Which kind of has a nice, kind of a cool sound. I've been actually pr uh, practicing just um, uh, for years, actually, you know, doing that kind of a thing too, getting the different percussive sounds just like with a flat finger. Um, so anyway, this one part. Okay, so I'll, the part I want to talk about a little bit is, um, I'll slow it down. It's sort of like, it's part of an improvisation part. And I did practice this obviously because it, it was kind of a newer thing that I do, but I'm combining these uh, these top side strings with this side to create sort of um, like a like a like a flam or a, or a hocket or uh, whatever the correct term is. Like if I'm playing. sense. So what's happening is I'm actually every note I hit left hand and then right hand. So the left hand keeps uh, moving around different notes and then the, the right hand basically uh, just kind of stays on the same notes but kind of an interesting, uh, kind of a cool sound, I guess, if you will, when, uh, when I'm doing that. And 
And then of course, while I'm doing that, the whole time I'm keeping the bass thing happening, which is sometimes it's it's actually harder than it seems. Um, but yeah. sense that one is basically just two notes and then two notes two notes left hand two notes right hand hey. yikes what's wrong with me today so that is like something um that i've been doing a lot more once i got this instrument just because the uh, the range on my my right hand expanded and you know it just it's got like a it's got its own sound like when I do this like if I do anyway <laughs> hopefully that one made sense cool so Let's see, um, do we have, what do we have going on here, any, uh, I guess I didn't find out about where the bar is located, hopefully I will later on. Yeah, so today's setup is kind of new again, so I have my uh, little keyboard and stuff up here, so hopefully that was going to make it easier, but I don't know, kind of maybe looks a little sloppy when I'm doing that. So we will see about that at some point. Any more uh, questions about the instrument or the, some of the tunes? I think we're pretty close to wrapping it up here today. Um, actually, before we go, I'm going to talk quickly about uh, my default technique in terms of tapping. When I do the tapping, um, I don't do legato almost, I mean, I don't do legato that much. Legato meaning like tap and then, you know, something like that. I actually lift my finger up, I'm exaggerating a little. I lift my finger up every time I tap. Same for going up and going down, like I'm just playing a scale right now. And uh, one of the big reasons why I actually lift up my finger is because if you do legato, uh, of course there's you know a good time and place for that as well. But if you do legato, uh, you can always, especially if you're you know playing like uh, three notes per string or even two, you can hear uh, the string skipping. When you change the string, it's pretty obvious. Like, So in order to avoid that, that's why I started doing um, tapping, or at least my default is to tap each note. Obviously there is a time and place for, for everything. So if you want like a, that kind of a thing, then you should, you know, or I should do like auto, but in general I want So in order to get that cleaner in terms of just like a, a one, um, like in one breath, so that's why I actually do do it with all tapping, like lifting up my finger each time and also hopefully you can see Ah Kazu-san, thumbs up, arigato gozaimasu, o hisashiri desu. You can see I'm actually also muting with my index finger quite a bit, uh, not when I'm playing super fast or if I do play super fast. Um, but when I'm playing slower, I actually, like I play, and then I'm muting each time with the index finger so we don't get like that accessory. Like if I'm not muting, hopefully you can hear 
Yeah, I think it's there. You can hear the ringing. Right? But if I mute it... This is without muting. You can hear that note, right? You can hear that string ringing. But if I mute it with the index finger... So you get... You get a lot cleaner sound, which is... Um, what, what, which is what we want, right? We want a clean sound, we want, we want it to have some control over what we're doing, and of course this helps, but like I keep saying, the open strings are still usable on this instrument. And by the way, if anybody wants to listen to if this F sharp is actually very effective in like an ensemble setting, um, by the way, like I do enjoy playing in ensembles. That's like my my favorite thing to do. I do a lot of soloist work as well, just because that helps me become a better ensemble player. Although if you do soloist too much, that could be bad for ensemble playing too. But neither neither here nor there. Um, yes. So there's a. I use this F sharp, the open F sharp. I believe the only recording that I use the open F sharp on is uh, with uh, some friends of mine in Japan. They're called Juichi. I will put the link uh, for their stuff maybe later on. And there's a tune of theirs called Flower Garden. And on that piece it's a ballad. And my friend Satoru actually plays stick. So he's basically playing all the parts. And there's a singer and there's even a kana player, which is a, a bamboo flute. I think that's the correct uh, description of a kana. Anyway, so Satoru is playing a stick, and so he's got like this whole thing happening, but he wanted me to play on the tune. It's a ballad, and it was really hard to come up with something um, that'll work, because, you know, every, everything was already there. So, but his stick, um, my instrument went a lot lower in terms of pitch than his stick did, so I went an octave lower to what his bass line already was, and it worked great. I was so surprised how it worked. The engineer, uh, Mr. Tata, he was like, oh, it gives me chills. And I gotta be honest, it gave me chills too. It was really, really awesome, actually. Um, yeah, so in that recording, I am actually really using, like, I think one of the parts uh, was just like a, you know, like a, I think, was there a thing written as an A sharp? Yeah, I think something like that. It was, or would it be flat A sharp? But anyway, something like that, where it was actually all, and you know, you can. I hopefully you can hear that. Uh, hopefully that's coming across clear. So that's basically. Uh, is that right? Yeah, it's pretty clear there, even if it's like such a low note. So uh, that worked greatly on that recording. So do check them out. I will link their stuff later on. And uh, yeah, well, thank you for joining me today. Um, it was a little discomb discombobulated, but not all of them can be winners, especially when I'm so young into this thing. So hopefully there was some good stuff in there. And uh, Pato, is that how you say your name? Thank you for joining. Really appreciate it. Okay, so um, yeah, I will continue doing this. And I'm not traveling until October, so uh, you guys are stuck with me doing this for a while. And it will keep getting better, I promise. So keep tuning in, and I will get to those questions. Next week, I will do some uh, exercises for independence. Although, a lot of times for me, thinking about independence or playing independence, I feel like a lot of it is like mental. And we can physically train for it, but mentally training for it is, is, is more important um, than the physical part. So I think when I talk about independence or when I try to explain about independence, I end up just going the mental aspect of it more than the physical. So I will try to come up with, or I will... I will be prepared to show you some physical uh, independence exercises, like a rhythm independence, because that's something I get quite uh, get asked quite a bit, and um, it's hard to generally answer that one. If I have a student in front of me, I can see what they need and I can tell them, um, like try this and try that. That's kind of how my teaching style works, 
it's very tailored, tailored towards somebody. Like I'll look at you and I say, okay, this is what you do and this is how we can expand on it. If you just say like, give me, give me a exercise to practice independence, yeah, that's a little more harder for me. So I'm gonna plug and say, if you are interested in um, online lessons, I do give those and they are surprisingly effective. So if you're interested in those, you know, uh, contact me, message me, and let's let's get this going. You know, I I'm very personal in terms of what I um, teach you. And a lot of times, I'm not teaching you what I do. I usually teach you what you do, but just how to do that a lot better. So, if that sounds like something that is interesting to you, yeah, uh, reach out to me. Um, and as always, we have the MTD Kubo fifteen thirty. 424, I think, <laughs> technically. Uh, we got the Labella strings, and we got Nordstrand pickups, we got curling cable, and today, actually, I was going through a uh, new neighbor Immerse, uh, a B2 preamp. I was actually asked about the preamp. Um, you can only get this in Japan right now, but if you want, you can shop on it online. Um, it's called B uh, B2 preamp by Inner Bamboo Instruments. And how can I forget? Let me go grab this really quick. As always, my uh, favorite time is to introduce to you one of my kokushi. Usaburo Kokushi is uh, one of the sponsors for me. And see, woohoo! If you are a Dragon Ball fan, you know who that is. That is Krillin. Isn't that awesome? His facial expression is priceless. I um, can't really get closer because if I do, it's going to be all blurry, you can't see his expression. So, check out their website and get your own Dragon Ball Krillin Kokish. Awesome! Well, thank you so much today everybody. And uh, next week, I am planning to talk about uh, some rhythm independent stuff. And I will touch up on some old videos. I will talk about some of the more metal days, if you will. Had some. Um, I still play that stuff if people ask me to, but in general, I, I do not, but, um, so I'll, I'll actually play some videos from, like, old stuff so you get some idea how, uh, where I came from in terms of, um, my development. Alright, well, thanks so much, and I bid you good night.